Welcome to today's video. Now looking back, it's been about five weeks since we've done a video on vitamin D. And I continue to believe this is an important immunological molecule. So I've put together a bit of news on that today. But first, I want to report on a very interesting article uh, from the um, press release from the French National Academy of Medicine. And this is the, uh, the translated version into English that's available at this website. And they correctly point out that vitamin D is a pro-hormone. In other words, the vitamin D that's synthesized in the skin is converted into a substance that essentially acts as an endocrine hormone. And an endocrine hormone is something that's produced in one part of the body and circulates carrying information to other parts of the body. And we know that there are receptors for vitamin D actually in every cell of the body. So this is a very important hormone that's synthesized from this vitamin D that's a pro-hormone. Now, we've had a bit of a debate on this channel, actually, as to where vitamin D is actually synthesized in the skin. And the consensus of opinion now is it, that it's produced in the dermis under the effect of ultraviolet light. So you might remember that the skin is in two layers. There's kind of a wavy line like that. And uh, that, that top part of the skin there, that's the epidermis. The epidermis. And then this lower part here is the dermis. The lower part of the skin. And below this is the subcutaneous tissues and muscles and things like that. And the hair follicles are in the uh, are in the dermis, for example. That they're, they're down here like this. So um, the dermis is the lower part of the skin. So we've sort of concluded, really, that vitamin D is produced primarily in the dermis, but under the effect of ultraviolet light from the sun. So it's produced by ultraviolet light, which is a component of the spectrum of sunlight. And once this is produced, it's transported to the liver and kidneys where it's transport, transformed into the active hormone. So people with kidney disease, for example, often can't produce enough of this active hormone and they have clinical effects such as demineralization of the bones that are related to the deficiency of the uh, activated vitamin D because the kidney is not in a fit state to convert it. But in, in you and me, hopefully, the kidneys are working perfectly and this is easily, uh, easily converted. Now, it's responsible for the intestinal absorption of calcium and, of course, bone health. And you probably know that bones need uh, calcium to, to remain healthy. But it's also got a modulating function of the immune system. This is not me speaking. This is the French National Academy of Medicine, the big shots in France. So it's got a modulating function of the immune system. So it mod modulates the function of the immune system by stimulating macrophages and dendritic cells. Now, this is interesting. So these dendritic cells are sort of, dendrite means tree-like. So th these dendritic cells are kind of this sort of shape. They have lots of, uh, lots of bits sticking out of them like this. Lots of dendrites and the nucleus in the middle there. And what happens is these detect when there's an antigen present. And an antigen, of course, would be a virus or a bacterium. So, so that their antigen detecting and antigen presenting cells. And these macrophages that are mentioned here, these are huge cells. And these macrophages migrate through the tissues. <clears throat> and when they migrate through the tissues, what they can do is they can release cytokines. to control things like uh, immune responses and antibacterial and antiviral responses. And they also engulf bacteria and viral cells and destroy them. So these are eating cells. And the eating cells are called phagocytes. So both of these cells are absolutely essential immunological cells. And th th this article, the French, the French National Academy of Medicine, are saying modulates the function of the immune system by stimulating macrophages and dendritic cells. So for a good immune system, these need to be stimulated by this activated vitamin D. Very important that they're stimulated. 
those immunological cells. And there are other functions as well, but those ones particularly are mentioned by the French medical authorities. And this, this modulates. Modulates means it can upregulate the response. So when you have an infection, you want to upregulate the immune inflammatory response. But then when you've got too much inflammation, you want to downregulate the inflammatory response. And of course, this is particularly important in COVID-19 disease because what we've looked at before is part of the problem in people that get complicated COVID-19 diseases. These are the air sacs here, the alveoli. And if these are inflamed, then these can fill up with fluid and the person can drown because the oxygen can't get out into the blood and the carbon dioxide can't get from the blood back into the alveoli to be breathed out because of this excessive inflammatory reaction. It's a bit like when you sprain your ankle, you get fluid around your ankle and in the same way you get fluid in your alveoli. And if you've watched this series before, you might have seen this in this excellent video in this excellent infographic that Liz made up for us. So the role that vitamin D plays in protecting the lungs from this excessive inflammatory response. And you can freeze frame that and read through it. But basically what's happening is in this inflammatory response, if it's not down modulated, if it's not down regulated, partly by the effects of these dendritic cells and macrophages, then the alveoli here can fill up with fluid. And that's exactly what we don't want. We want them to be full of fresh air so the oxygen can get in and uh, the carbon dioxide can get out. And we also notice here that this affects a variety of cells. So we mentioned, actually we mentioned macrophages. Macrophages and actually these dendritic cells actually derive from these monocytes. But here we notice that the vitamin D affects the lymphocytes and the neutrophils as well although those, the lymphocytes and the neutrophils are not specifically mentioned by, by the French uh, medical authorities. Um, so that has a role in the acute respiratory distress syndrome where the alveoli fill up with fluid and is one of the causes of mortality in severe COVID-19. So it's regulating, upregulating when necessary, downregulating when we have too much. So it's got a role in regulating and suppressing the cytokine inflammatory response. So if the immune cells are producing too much of these cytokines, then that's causing too much inflammation in the alveoli and in other parts of the body, this so-called cytokine storm. And that can cause this acute respiratory distress syndrome. And in acute respiratory distress syndrome, the alveoli fill up with fluid and the patient effectively drowns. So this is a very important modulating role, upregulating when necessary, downregulating when we don't want it, and that requires vitamin D in the right concentrations or in adequate concentrations to be able to do that, according to the French National Academy of uh, Medicine. Now, what else are these, uh, are these reputable people in France saying? A significant correlation between low serum vitamin D levels and mortality in COVID-19. In other words, what they're saying is if you look at all the cases of COVID-19 that have been documented, you can find a correlation. So people with higher levels of vitamin D have lower mortalities. They're less likely to die. People with low levels of vitamin D have higher mortality. They are more likely to die. This is a correlation that they have identified doesn't prove that it's causal, but it's a correlation. And this phenomena generally, the French medical authorities are saying, follows a north-south gradient. So in southern places where it's sunnier, then there tends to be more vitamin D. But this isn't quite always true because the Nordic countries, so Finland, Sweden, um, Norway, for example, they use a lot of vitamin D supplements now, as you know, these countries are well to the north and they don't get a lot of sunshine all through winter and they have a very long winter and very long dark nights. So, I don't know, probably probably ten, about 10 years ago now, the authorities in these countries realised and the community health people in these countries realised that a lot of the population were not getting enough vitamin D 
and they started supplementing vitamin D with supplements and they started putting it in quite a lot of food products as well. So they had 40 vitamin D fortified food products. And that paradoxically, well not paradoxically, but that explains why even though they're further north, the people in these countries have had, they have less vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is less common in these northern countries because they are aware of the risk, whereas a lot of other people unfortunately don't seem to be. So that was interesting. Now, um, they, the, uh, they're saying, the French authorities are saying it's not as preventative or therapeutic. There's not enough data for that yet. They can't be definitive about this. But they say by mitigating the inflammatory storm, this is cytokine storm, and its consequences, and its consequences can be shock and acute respiratory distress syndrome, as we've seen. And shock basically means the blood pressure is so low that the tissues of the body are no longer perfused with blood and the tissues of the body don't have an adequate blood supply, which of course is a degenerative and can be a rapidly fatal condition. So by, by mitigating the inflammatory storm and its consequences, it could be considered as an adjunct to any form of therapy. In other words, whatever treatment these patients are getting, they could be given vitamin D as well as an adjunct. And they point out this is simple and it is inexpensive. So basically they're saying, why not? This is a simple thing to do. And uh, it confirms its recommendations to ensure vitamin D supplementation to the French population. So they're advising that the French population takes vitamin D supplements. And they're also recommending that rapid serum vitamin D testing in people over the age of 60 with COVID-19 so what they're saying is that if people are admitted to hospital or people are diagnosed with COVID-19 and they're over the age of 60, and I agree with this completely, in fact I would do it in younger people as well, but they're saying for people over the age of 60 who are diagnosed with COVID-19 they should have a blood test to determine their blood levels of vitamin D to see if they are deficient in vitamin D in their blood. So as soon as someone's diagnosed with COVID-19, they are advising they should have a blood test for their levels of vitamin D, which is a remarkably good idea. And the French, the French people are saying they should be giving a lo given a loading dose of 50 to 100,000 international units, quite a high dose, if people over the age of 60 are found to be deficient. So they could be, should be given this large loading dose. This is not me speaking, this is the French authorities. If you want to take it, contact your own doctor and get it prescribed. But this is what the French guidelines are recommending. In case of deficiency, which could help limit the respiratory complications. So they're testing people, and if they found out to be low, then they give them a rapid boost, a big dose to boost it up and get it up quickly. And they think this is going to reduce respiratory complications. And they recommend vitamin D supplement of 800 to 1,000 international units a day in people under 60 as soon as the diagnosis of COVID-19 is confirmed. So what they're saying here is that people under the age of 60 don't necessarily need to get a blood test. But as soon as they are confirmed as having COVID-19, they should start taking a relatively low dose supplement. So recommends vitamin D supplementation in people under 60 as soon as the diagnosis of COVID-19 is confirmed. Now this is interesting. So what the French authorities are saying, as soon as a diagnosis is confirmed, if someone's under the age of 60, they should just start taking vitamin D, 800 to 1,000 units a day. Just start taking it, regardless, start taking it. That's what they're saying. However, if people are over the age of 60, therefore in a much higher risk category, then they should have their blood level tested and if they're found to be different they should be given a bolus dose to whap their blood levels up really quickly to reduce respiratory complications. So I think that's actually pretty convincing evidence um, from the French National Academy of uh, Medicine. I really don't see a, a problem with, with what they're doing at all there and, and that's, the rec that's, the, the, that's the French recommendations. Now, um, let's go on and look at um, some other up-to-date um, research. Here we are. Yeah. 
Now, this article here, uh, very interesting. Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. I always post the links. Now, this is this article is called uh, Vitamin D, a low hanging fruit, something that's easy to correct. And this is what I've been saying. It's a variable that's easy to correct. And we just don't seem to be doing it. And this is published on Medscape, which is a very well researched uh, website. And check, check it there. Now, what they're saying is, what, what this article on Medscape is saying, there's observational data from various countries suggesting inverse links. In other words, the higher the vitamin D, the lower the complications. In other words, the lower the vitamin D, the higher the complications. It's an inverse link of severe COVID-19 responses and mortality. So the disease is likely to be less severe if vitamin D levels are high and people are less likely to die. So let's say that again. People are less likely to die um, according to these correlation observations. Now, there are no randomized controlled trials. So how sure is this article? that they are how sure are they that vitamin d is efficacious well the answer is there's a lot of background theory but there is no actual randomized controlled trial in covid19 disease it hasn't been done but it makes sense but it's important to say that we don't know for sure because the work has not been done and so people will often say there's no evidence. Well, of course, there's no evidence. No one's done the trial. So it's a pity that these trials are not underway. They really should be underway. But as of now, there is no trial data. Having adequate vitamin D is important, especially for those at highest risk of COVID-19, according to this article. And you can look in this article. It's fully referenced. And that is, of course, consistent with what the French authorities are saying. So it's always encouraging if you're looking at various sources and you find they agree, that's always good. So, someone once said that multiple collaboration is the closest we will get to truth. And uh, it's a bit cynical, but, but there, there is evidence that, 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 that is, that's true. If everyone agrees, then there's a greater chance that it's likely. Not always true by any means, but um, multiple, multiple, multiple collaboration, if it's based on empirical data, is good. And the article admits freely that there's a possibility that vitamin D, vitamin D has no role. This all might be rubbish. Unlikely. Or perhaps more likely it could simply be a marker. So vitamin D could be a marker for someone else. So that people that are low in vitamin D tend to be less healthy generally. That's a possibility. Or thirdly, as, as I suspect, it's a causal factor. And thereby correcting low levels of vitamin D would have a, a therapeutic effect. Higher levels of vitamin D aren't going to boost the immune system. Lower levels of vitamin D could reduce the efficiency of the immune system, is what I am hypothesizing. Now, Spain and northern Italy have the highest rates of vitamin D deficiency. So these studies have been done. So Spain and northern Italy have the highest rates of vitamin D deficiency uh, because Spain and Italy do not formally fortify foods or recommend supplements. So despite these countries being very sunny, what you often find is people in these sunny countries tend to keep out the sun because they're too hot. So I was talking to a friend of mine from uh, India last week and I said, uh, can, can you advise uh, your patients to go out and get some sun? Take the shirt off and get a bit of sun on them. And they said, oh, no, John, no, no, no. Indian people don't go in the sun. It's not their culture to go in the sun. There's that old song from the colonial era, only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. And, and, and that, that culture is still there in India. It's just people just don't go out in the sun. Therefore, although it's sunny all day, they actually end up with very low sun exposure and then relatively low levels of serum vitamin D, relatively low levels of vitamin D in the blood. So Spain and Italy, again, low levels of vitamin D because they don't go in the sun that much some do, of course, but, but uh, apparently um, the levels of vitamin D are low. Having said that, I've seen lots of Spanish and Italian people sunbathing, so this isn't universal. But of course, older people that are indoors a lot of the time aren't going to be exposed to the sun. And of course, it's the older people that have died 
primarily from the COVID-19 disease. And as well as that, in old people, the skin produces vitamin D more slowly. So even if old people are sunbathing, they will produce vitamin D more slowly. So they would need longer sun exposure to get the same dose. Norway, Finland, Sweden had higher vitamin D levels, as we looked at from the French study. Now, European countries, this, there's a paper here in, in this. Look, look it up in this reference I've given you, I've just given you. Now, what they found was that they've done observational studies and the p-value of the correlation between high levels of vitamin D and low levels of morbidity and mortality in COVID-19 disease or the correlation between low levels of vitamin D and high rates of um, morbidity and mortality in COVID-19 disease, they found that correlation has a p-value of 0.046. That's the p-value. In other words, there's a 95.4% chance that this is a genuine difference and only a 4.6% chance that this result arose by chance. So it's very likely, 95.4% likely, that these correlations are indicating a genuine correlation and that it is not an artefact of the statistics. But of course, this is a correlation. And of course, it's famous in research that correlation does not indicate causality. So, for example, the first research study I ever participated in was called the International Study of Infarct Survival, way back in the um, late, late 80s, this was, late 80s. And, and what they found was there was a very high correlation at that time in the late 80s between telephone ownership and ischemic heart disease. Very high correlation. In other words, people that had telephones were more likely to have ischemic heart disease proving that telephones caused ischemic heart disease. Well, no, obviously not. That's silly. It was just a correlation. People that were richer compared to people in poorer countries who didn't have telephones, they were more likely to have ischemic heart disease. It won't be true anymore now because lots of poor people do have telephones now. But at that time, it, it was a correlation. So it clearly didn't mean that ischemic heart disease was caused by telephone ownership. Of course not. That's ridiculous. But yet the correlation was statistically significant. So we can never say that correlation equals causality. It's a correlation. Uh, a relationship has been observed. A consistent relationship has been observed. But it doesn't mean that the vitamin D deficiency is causing the more severe COVID-19 disease, even though I suspect it does. Optimising vitamin D status to recommended uh, recommendations by national and international public health agencies will certainly have potential benefits for COVID-19. That's from the Irish Medical Journal quoted in this, uh, in this piece, but do check that for yourself. So it looks like the Irish Medical Journal uh, authors are convinced. And we have looked at reports from Ireland before who've done some uh, pretty pioneering work on this. Now the immune modulation. This is the up regulating of the immune system and the down regulating of the inflammatory response data from china france germany italy iran south korea spain switzerland united kingdom united states risk of severe covid disease in low levels of vitamin d so in all of these countries they found that low levels of vitamin d were correlated with increased risk of severe covid19 which is caused in part by the inflammatory response mediated by the cytokine storm. People with vitamin D deficiency had 17.3%. People with normal vitamin D levels only had 14.6%, but the difference between those is actually 15.6% for the figures that they had. It was actually a 15.6% difference. So that would indicate, if this is true, for the numbers that this study was looking at, and check, check it there, it's on there, uh, that, that, that would indicate that by getting vitamin D levels up to the national recommended levels would reduce severe complications by 15.6% if that is accurate, which of course would be, would be uh, brilliant. Now, ethnic minorities disproportionately affected. Yes, we know that. Now, this was a fascinating account. There was two British... Epi um, not epidemiologists, endocrinologists, doctors that specialise in these hormone things. 
and they wrote to the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. I didn't know about this, but it's called the BAPIO. So the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin advising these endocrinologists advised all of these members. So these are people with darker coloured skin living in the cloudy United Kingdom, spending 50, 60 hours a day working in hospital, not out in the sun very much. They recommended that they all get their vitamin D levels checked. And I would agree. I think any anyone who has dark coloured skin should get their vitamin D levels checked. Because if your vitamin D level levels are low, then it's easy to correct it. In fact, anyone really who's in northern latitude should have the vitamin D levels checked, in my view. Because it's easy to correct it. And this was consistent with a, a large single dose or vitamin D supplementation in adult populations. This is a systematic review here. Now, this review was saying that you could have a large single dose just to bunk your levels of vitamin D up. As the French authorities were saying in people over the age of 60 who have just been diagnosed with COVID-19 and they suggest a booster dose of 100,000 units as a one-off. Now, we actually know that, well, we don't know, but we've, we've looked at studies that suggest it's much better to take a smaller dose on a daily or weekly basis. But again, they were saying a single dose of vitamin D3, huge do dose, 300,000 units, are effective at improving vitamin D status for up to three months. But we have looked at other trials that says it's better to take a smaller dose on a daily basis. Now, at the moment, I got these ones from Boots. Uh, these are the ones I'm currently taking. Maximum strength vitamin D. This is, I think these are the strongest ones you can buy in the UK. So you need to I only take one of these a day. So ju 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 just, just one of those. Um, it's maximum strength vitamin D and it's 75 micrograms and that is 3,000 international units. So I'm not telling you what to take, but I am telling you that I take at the moment 75 micrograms a day, which is 3,000 international units. Although to tell you the truth, I spent quite a bit of time at the allotment last week because uh, in my spare time, um, I like to grow uh, food. And... Um, so I work at the allotment and uh, it wasn't a pleasant sight, but I took my shirt off and I wore my shorts and worked in the sunshine and I got quite a lot of uh, sunlight there. So I, I didn't take it last week because I was getting sunlight instead. Um, but um, I would like to get my levels checked. I wish I could. Uh, it's, it's hard to get them done where, where I am at the moment. But anyway, so um, the daily doses of a thousand units seem reasonable, they're saying. That would be 25 micrograms. But of course, it depends what your levels are now. If your levels are already low, it can take time to build it up. This is why you need to see your own doctor and do this on an individualised basis from your own blood levels, ideally. Ideally. But I haven't, so I'm just basically blindly taking one of those every day. That's what I'm doing. Um, testing and government recommendations during COVID-19. These are the recommendations from the US National Institute of Health. Um, 400 to 800 international units per day will result in blood levels that are sufficient to maintain bone health and normal calcium metabolism. Now, the reason people were switched on to the vitamin D in the first place was the rickets, that people got bendy bones and bow-legged, bow the, 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 uh, the old bow-legged um, problem that we used to get in the old days. And, and still do, in fact. Uh, rickets is still a problem in some parts of the world. Um, so this is like enough if you take it every day for, for day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month, month out to stop you getting uh, bone problems. But that's the minimum dose. And we now know that vitamin D does so many other things. We now know there's vitamin D in every cell in the receptors in every cell in the body. So just to say that take enough for bone health is, is very old fashioned thinking, really. It could well be that it turns out we need a lot more than this because um, that's just the minimum dose required to stop getting uh, rickets. But even that depends on taking it uh, every day on a regular basis. And as I say, if you're starting off from a low level, it would take a long time to build up. And the recommendations from Public Health England, don't take my word for it, click on it yourself. Um, again, that they're recommending similar levels. I think, I think it's 800 units a day all year round for people with darker coloured skin. I think it's 800 units a day for um, everyone else over winter. 
And Public Health England helpfully tell us there's not sufficient evidence to support recommending vitamin D for reducing the risk of COVID-19. Of course, there's not. No one's done the studies. What a pointless thing to say. Can't cross it out. It's Public Health England. <laughs> but it's a, it's a self-obvious statement. And uh, again, just our second infographic from Liz that you might have seen before is the darker the colour of the skin, the more slowly the vitamin D is, is produced. So again, freeze frame and uh, look at that at your leisure. Now, that's all I want to say today. I just want to say one thing before I finish, though. Um, I got quite a, um, you know, quite a moving uh, email from the United States. Um, yeah, we're on it. We're on it. We're on the second screen, aren't we? That's right. Um, now, um, what, what this is saying is... Um, it's protesting against recent events in, in the United States. And uh, they're doing so using ribbons on trees. Now, in England, we don't really have a, uh, a culture of putting ribbons on trees. I think it's a bit of an American thing. But uh, they're protesting against recent events in the States. And uh, they're doing that in a completely peaceful culturally specific way with a uh, great dignity that is not endangering the lives of other people but is clearly getting the message across that the people in this street uh, believe these things and uh, they're, they're voicing their protest their legitimate protest and they're voicing it in a legitimate way which is not risking uh, spreading uh, COVID-19. Um, I'm not going to talk about that now because it's for the next video but I have looked at new data on new cases from the United States and thankfully at the moment they are not going up so I'm really hopeful that they're not going to go up um, and that the fact that these protests are primarily outside has reduced the level of transmission. I'm very hopeful of that, but I do fear there is going to be a dramatic increase in cases in the States. But that's a, that's a topic for another video. So there we go. That's a bit of an update on vitamin D. And uh, that's what I'm taking when I don't get any when I don't get any sun, if I can get the right screen. There we go. <laughs>